Hi everyone, I hope that you're all taking care of yourselves out there today. I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about a personal hobby project of mine called the Human Spaceflight Project. This is a project that I'm working as an independent game developer. Um, I am a senior technical artist at Unity Technologies and that does consume pretty much every waking hour during the work week and I absolutely love my work at Unity. Um, but I would say that sometimes it doesn't scratch that sort of obsessive creative itch that I have as a creator, where even when I'm not working on a project for others, for a client at Unity or something like that, um, I feel the need to build something that I can experiment with and that I'm not confined to the bounds of, I would say, maybe the client's needs or requirements. And I can just experiment freely and I can make a lot of mistakes and the only individual that I'm accountable to there in that form of creativity is really myself. Um, but so the Human Spaceflight Project, uh, where this came from was really my time at NASA a couple of years ago. I was a developer at NASA and I was at the height of my passion for space travel and space and just the inspired by the idea of transcending the boundaries of Earth and sort of everything that goes on here. And so I came up with the Human Spaceflight Project. And originally it was intended to be an educational thing that would sort of put the user in this game or educational experience into a crew module capsule in a rocket and they would launch from Earth. They would fly to the moon through space. They would orbit the moon and then they would return to Earth and enter the atmosphere and they would splash down in the ocean. And I wanted the user to experience the intensity uh, that the real world counterparts you know, the real crew would experience going through these things. Um, but after I left NASA and ended up working at Unity, this idea sort of transitioned into, I could make this into a game and I could use VR to do this. And I think that this would be not just educational, but I think this would be an intense, really cool, enjoyable experience for a user. And I thought, that, you know, this could be a commercially uh, viable idea. This will allow me to scratch that creative itch after hours uh, to do something that I can experiment with. Um, and also I find that indie development on personal hobby projects allows you to brush up or keep current on skills and software technologies and tools that you might not get to exercise in your core job, your core work, wherever you work at that company. You may find yourself always in Substance Painter or always in Unity but you might not be able to get into other sorts of software and learn those things. So indie development definitely allows you to keep right on the tip of your toes and current on all the latest things, and latest tools and frameworks and SDK and allows you to import those and just experiment with new SDKs. And then the great thing is, is that can inform your actual work with your coworkers at work. And you say, hey, I know about this tool. It's actually stable. It works. It will solve this problem. I digress on this. But this is why I think there is real value in being an indie developer, even though you do have, quote, a day job. So this right here is an early logo I did probably about three years ago. And uh, when I backburnered this project and didn't work on it for a long time, I'm not pleased with it today, but it is the PSD in Photoshop, the layered document that I still have. And so I start from this and I look at it. And this is where I will work from. I don't think that this logo is very dynamic. I don't think that it feels very inspiring. And I don't think it's very usable across different aspect ratios. So if I want to turn this into an icon or in the different social media channels that have different profile picture croppings and stuff. So I probably may reach out to someone on Fiverr who specializes specifically in graphic design and have them help me come up with something more eye-catching and more dynamic and I'll explain what inspired this project to them and hopefully that will help guide and inform their artwork. It is difficult as an indie developer handling everything, marketing, graphic design. Uh, I build the websites because I'm also a web developer. So doing CSS and HTML and building a responsive website, building the game, doing all the audio code and art. Um, luckily there are a few things that can help you out with this. So I'm using Google Drive. I do have Dropbox. I just find Google Drive to be more intuitive visually for an artist. Dropbox is great, but it doesn't have a lot of tools for, you know, like image display and stuff as, as much as, as Google Drive does. So 
This, for instance, is like my reference images folder, and I even I'll even under images I'll even put reference 3D models. Um, so reference 3D models is an interesting one, um, so that everything is accurate to real world scale and accurate to basically what uh, NASA's real world metrics. My project is leaning on the uh, I want to represent the Orion capsule crew module, which is this silver and white. Uh, looking thing here. This is what the crew will travel to the moon and back from and re-enter in. Um, so I wanted to make sure that was represented accurately. And then the rocket that they will fly up on is the SLS or Space Launch System. It has some boosters on the side and a core stage and that little capsule is up in here. This is what I wanted to use to represent the vehicle and the experience that I'm building that these crew members or you as a user will travel in. I want this to just look exactly like the real world. Um, luckily, NASA has a 3D model resources. So if you just Google NASA 3D models or NASA 3D resources, they have a ton of reference and open source 3D models that you can reference to build your own meshes. So, which is really great. Some of them are textured. Um, some of them are very old, but again, they work really well we look here, This uh, some of this stuff is added in, like some of the stuff I'm referencing was added back in 2011, 10. This was added in 2016. So again, it's just a reference. It's a good starting point for spatial distances, scale, stuff like that. Um, so I love using Google Drive for the ability to go through these references and have them synced across all my devices. If I'm on my other laptop, I'm able to also go on that and Google Drive just works. It just works, it's all shared. This is the interior of the capsule. It holds a crew of I think like four in there. It's very cramped. I do have specific uh, reference to the interior of the capsule because I'm gonna need to build that out. It is a really tight space in there for these folks that do have to travel. But I think that this could make for a very interesting VR experience, especially with all these interactive cockpit panels and things like that. Uh, that you can use to control the spacecraft. Um, so NASA 3D models, really great resource. I am using Trello to track all of my tasks. Let's see if I zoom in here, I have a backlog. So I'm trying to use agile development for this and I have my current tasks and I've completed. Honestly, I can move clouds over probably, I'm not updating this enough. But you see, I need to build the interior cockpit for Orion, the crew module. I need to finish the SLS core stage model. I've got clouds added. I'm going to show those. All the things I need to do. I'm also using Git uh, through a GitHub repo to store my project. I would recommend, even as an indie developer, to always use uh, a repo. Uh, whether you're using Unity's built-in uh, cloud storage, which they do offer in the editor as a service, and you, there is a free tier, I do believe. Don't quote me if I'm wrong. Uh, so there's source control there. Basically, just try to use source control, whether that's through a free tier Amazon server and using something like Tortoise SVN or Perforce. I find Git to be pretty easy for me uh, with large file system set up on it so that LFS, so that you can do a grit, Git attributes file here, and it can store these really large FBX files that get to be really big, and it can store the 3ds Max files in a very small file size. I think I pay five dollars a month f to Git uh, here for my repositories, and I have 22 repositories, and they're not um, almost all of these are not forks of other repositories. Some of them are, but a lot of them are my own projects. It's a really good space to not just store the version control of your project, which you're absolutely going to want. Uh, and this goes back to that nature of experimental dev. As an indie developer, you're willing to throw in a new SDK that's unproven or a bit of code that you're not sure is going to work with this version of the editor or something. You're going to break things. You're going to want to be able to roll back to a known stable version of your project, and that's where source control will save your your rear. Um, but it's also a good spot in the README to sort of link to your Google Drive, to your Trello, to all of your other pages. Obviously, I have a link that's broken there. Um, so it's good for that too. Um, so to show off some a goodie here is this matcap shader. Um, 
or these matcap textures. So this is a VR project, so it's basically Android mobile VR is what I'm doing. I want this to be to work without a cable, so you can do this anywhere in your home, wherever you are. But if we look here on Git at Nidorks, N-I-D-O-R-X, matcaps, this repo, he's offering for free all of these different matcap textures at different resolutions. So if you don't know what a matcap is, it is a very simplified lighting model that uses a texture map, a single texture map, to give you sort of all of the look of glossiness and fake lighting and reflectivity and everything. And you can have transparency on it for glass. You can apply normal maps to it for a bumpy surface. Um, but the value in it is a matte cap doesn't use real-time lighting. Generally, it can, but it doesn't generally. And so this simplified lighting model is super fast and optimal mobile especially on Android. If we look at this image here, we can see we have a whole lot of things going on here. We have what looks like a gloss. It's faked in the texture. We have specularity, uh, semblance here, diffuse color, everything. The great thing about matte caps too is you can send them in as a grayscale. This is sending in a color, and then you can just molt over a color. So you can change the color, but it does great at like metallics, glass, dielectrics. This is just a sample of some of the shading effects. You can even get like some x-ray looking effects too, but um, you can get like creepy horror underlighting and backlighting. But I think for painted steel and things like that, for metals, for glossy services and metallics, this is going to work great with the type of assets that I'm going to be building out. This is going to be ideal and it's going to run really well on mobile. So I would definitely Take a look like look at this it looks so cool it looks like there's it almost looks like there's a reflection probe or real-time reflections going on but it's all fakery right it's all just from a texture map a matte cap um, that kind of trickery is awesome so i would suggest looking at this nidorks matte caps now these are these are the textures if you want shaders that use uh, these matte cap textures <coughs> excuse me gene moreno's uh, free matte cap shaders here in the Unity Asset Store are absolutely great. He even has some that like in matte caps you can do tune shading. So it doesn't have to be sort of a, a realistic type of shading. It, it can be very stylized, but yeah, it works great for metals. He, he even has one where it can look like, like I said, an x-ray. So free matte cap shaders on the Unity Asset Store. And then, of course, that repo I was looking at. So that's how I'm doing source control. That's how I'm tracking my tasks. I've shown you the logo, I'm pretty certain, that I made. We dive into what I have in the Unity project. This is the scene that I have right now. These are the assets that I'm going to want to use those matte cap shaders on. So in my scene, I have the mobile launcher. It is not textured at this moment, so I do need to get it into um, substance painter and bake out some procedural maps on that and get it textured to where it looks really nice i've got a waving flag shader here that i'm going to use there are some flags and iconography around this launch complex so uh, texturing on this it's just flat shaded right now in different colored materials for the launcher and then of course this L sls core rocket stage and boosters it's not done it doesn't have the tip here at the top at all the egress, I believe the egress system up top is missing a lot of details, but this has been rebuilt by me in 3ds Max using the 3D meshes that are provided by NASA. And they're extremely high resolution meshes for this SLS rocket. They're not usable in VR. So you can really just use them as a reference and, but you have to build your own VR optimized assets over top of it. So I'm building, this is a brand new mesh that I'm building over top of it and it's been be built by me and it's been reduced and simplified all over. Um, the mesh that they serve up on NASA's website almost looks like scan data of this rocket, dare I say, but it may have just been smoothed over and over and over again for an offline render, which is probably the case. So this is real world scale. This little guy here is about five foot 10 inches. I made him a little shorter than a typical six foot tall male because I want to account for a female height too. So a female may be five four or five six, and a man may be six foot. 
And I think that 510 is a good average between that to make sure everything's, you know, that I do build up custom, not using reference assets, uh, is built around that sort of average scale. If you look at this guy, you do get a sense of how absolutely massive this space launch system rocket is. It is absolutely off the charts massive. So he's sort of my ground truth in making sure their sanity in the scale. The uh, sky dome in the background is just a, um, I'm looking for, um, the sky dome in the back is just a sphere uh, with the uh, normals inverted to only show on the inside. It's really low poly and it is using a shader graph that I built the other day. I want uh, to, I wanted to replicate the look of the procedural unity sky dome, but um, I didn't want the overhead uh, for mobile VR of that on an Android platform. So with like procedural sun inside of it and everything, all of the extra calculations it's doing, this is literally just a uh, two gradients being lerped between a set of colors and then the ability to uh, sort of just uh, using a power node just to sort of uh, increase that lerp or decrease the intensity of that so that I can sort of increase a, a cause atmospheric effects which looks really convincing. Uh, and also wanted the ability to just be able to customize this and not be limited by Unity's procedural skybox and be able to, if this is a night scene, exterior scene, I wanna be able to have stars and stuff and maybe a moon instead. So I have the full control in this shader graph now of adding those features, be a little more difficult with the procedural sky. Um, these clouds are just shuriken particles uh, and normally I love VFX graph and I work with that through work at Unity and I prefer that because everything's on the GPU and it's highly optimized and fast for millions of particles. But <clears throat> there were a couple logical reasons for going with Shuriken and that I don't need a million particles uh, for this mobile VR thing for the clouds. I just need enough clouds for it to be convincing to be a sky. <clears throat> when I did my first test with Shuriken here and I looked through my game view, and I built the APK and tested on the headset. They looked great. They look like real clouds to me in the headset because in the VR headset, the Quest 2 headset, you lose a lot of detail. You lose a lot of resolution and granularity at the pixel level. And so even this detail I see in the editor is lost in the headset. So I thought, well, VFX graph is going to be definitely overkill for just the few clouds that I need to pull off a convincing effect. And plus they looked good in the headset. Just adding a normal map into the particle effect and, act, and adding a little bit of uh, fake backscattering using the emission uh, baked um, in the normal map gave it depth and it gave the, the backsides of them enough lighting to where they didn't look completely unnatural. And again, it's a custom shader, so I can go in there and I do think I want to add maybe some fake transmission through the backside. I do, these do respond to the directional light. And uh, the other decision-making reason was is I did some due diligence uh, looking on the forums and Unity Answers at VFX Graphs, uh, any issues or performance things with the Quest 2 headset specifically in that GPU, and there were some issues. And in URP, VR, VFX Graph is still officially in experimental uh, stage. So because of the risk, and the long-term consideration of how long I may be working on this, I stuck with Shuriken. If I select every particle in here, and um, let me reset my viewport, something due to the recording. And by the way, the layout that I use is over here, it's tall, and then I will go with single column over here. Yeah, okay, we fixed that. I'll hide some of these little helpers. But that is the layout that I prefer to use, and I just switch between game view and uh, and scene view. So going back here, if I select all of these particles, which I have selected, we see here in our little debugger, we only have 570 particles. So we're not pushing a lot of particles, and they're not super big. So if we look at shaded wireframe, a lot of them are really small, and so they're not kind of blitting over the entire screen. And I've kind of sparsely populated them just to enough to sell the effect that it is a mildly cloudy sky, but mostly a sunny day and prevent these sort of overdraw or fill rate issues 
It is against a fully opaque solid background here with the sky. Um, but I've tried to negate those issues with fill rate and overdraw as much as I can. So if we just look at a random cloud, max particles is set to 20. So we'll never allow more than 20 particles at any given time. Emission is set to one over time because these are particles that are intended to live very long. They will live so long that they will live well past the transitions of the cut scenes, right? So all of that has been considered for the performance implications on the specific platform that I am using. So shuriken particles, perfectly fine uh, for what I'm using. Um, what else would I say in the scene? So we've talked about the skybox, we've talked about the clouds, we've talked about these art assets. The ground is proxy placeholder, but yes, terrain needs to come in and it will, there will probably be a proxy terrain in today. I went in Google Earth and I captured uh, from the top down in 2D from Google Earth, I've captured this launch complex. So the space launch system and the Orion capsule are sitting right now on top of uh, launch complex 39B at Kennedy Space Center down here on the east coast of Florida. And it's so close to the coast, if we look here up in the corner, we see the ocean and the beach. So that's how close it is. If I go to... I don't believe I have it open, but if I go to Google Earth and uh, we go in here, yeah, I'm already here. So here is Launch Complex 39B. There is the ocean. An interesting bit of information here is you see this Launch Complex. Uh, I live right here. So here's the Launch Complex. I live right here. It's not that far. It's about 25, 30 minutes away. Anytime Elon launches a Falcon 9 rocket or something like that, I'm in New Smyrna Beach right there, actually. It's showing right now. Um, anytime Elon launches one of his heavies or Falcon 9s, we see it very clearly from the backyard. And, and to put context into that, this is where NASA's SLS is. This is where Elon launches his Falcon 9 heavies and his rockets and stuff from here. This is the SpaceX building. He leases this launch complex and this building to work on assembly of his rockets and deployment. And this is where they launch from. And this is where NASA, that's 39A. And 39B is where NASA currently has it. So this is where I've captured that imagery. And this is where I've also used the distance tools in here to sort of capture, if we use this little distance tool here to capture these known distances across this terrain. So I'm able to mark this off and get sort of a spatial reference. So once I get this in 3ds Max on a plane, at the exact resolution of this image and the plane matches the resolution of that image then I will scale it up to a reference object that is 890 meters wide and once I match that then all of the other scales should ideally line into place assuming that the sort of orthographic projection of this capture is close enough obviously it's a little off because we see the satellite there is a slight angle on some of these towers that we look at here. So the orthographic projection is obviously skewed a little in this direction, right? Facing towards our right. We can see that here in this channel. Um, so we try to account for that. But honestly, close enough is good enough for this. Uh, this is VR, Andro an Android platform here. So it's limited. It's not going to be tremendously detailed. But this is where that terrain will go. The extents of this view area right now here with the Sky Dome currently is about 900 meters out. Um, and as we can see, the extents of this um, facility here is about 890. Now I do would like to include just a little bit of ocean visible just for the artistic or aesthetic look of it. So we may expand the Sky Dome and the clouds just a little bit to bring ocean in. This scene is really primarily going to be intended for a cutscene, so it's not going to be interactive for the VR user, only in the respect that the user will be able to swivel their head and kind of look around and marvel at what happens and then look up as this rocket lifts off and the sequence happens. Um, so this is just an external sort of camera tra transition scene. Uh, we will most of the experience will take place inside of the Orion crew module, which I do have a crew module built out. This is the crew module. Again, it's real world scale. There, is, there are no portholes or anything cut into it, and there are no details 
inside of this module, but this is exactly um, this is exactly the interior that this interior here in the capsule that you will spend most of your experience in, in VR doing. So the camera will transition from the interior and you having an interactive mode with everything inside of this capsule and sort of that freedom to move around inside of there where you can, but it will also transition to these sort of static positioned uh, cameras outside. And so this is the outside exterior shot. The idea being is that I do a little bit of marketing through social media channels and the web early on, and I can do the wow factor of of sort of that, that launch and that takeoff. I have a ton of reference of that here, so maybe to give context to that, you see NASA's done a CG representation of what this launch of this exact rocket may look like. This is great reference, but it's also sort of that wow factor. And I may borrow some of these camera angles here as well, and sort of some of these effects. Look at that. This just looks awesome. So the idea was is you can kind of sell, and especially when it bursts through the clouds there. That's just awesome. The idea being is that I can sell the idea of this project to the general public, like sell it in their minds uh, and cause an attraction to it. Uh, before I have to show any of the VR interactivity, kind of saving the best part to last, which would be that real world simulation of the experience inside the cockpit from a first person view, which I think would be super cool. Um, if you're interested any more on this, uh, I don't have a website or anything set up and very few social media channels, but as soon as I start building more out that I can capture and kind of develop some imagery from this, I will. And I'll get that up and we can get these channels set up that folks can follow it. Um, but just feel free to comment down in the videos, comment channels. If you're interested and you have any feedback to anything that I'm doing or any insight that you can give, uh, I'm open to any and all insight and feedback and uh, that would be awesome. So until the next update, thank you.